So, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us mm-hmm. for an Audible Sessions interview about your brand new book, The Audacity. Thank you for having me here. It's not exactly chronological, but you take us through different parts of your life. How did you first get into performing? Because it was something that you were interested in from a really young age. Yeah. I mean, we were not athletic, the girls and myself, my sisters and I were like not into sports. And I don't know if that comes from like a traditionalist upbringing or what. I think my mom wasn't interested. You know, my mom would say, why would I run unless someone's chasing me? And I still don't know why one would run. (laughs) And we don't care where the ball goes. It's not my business. I would never throw myself in front of a ball or be like, oh, I don't understand the millions of pounds behind that industry. Equally, enjoy your football. But I loved um, music and dance and I didn't love piano, but my mother said that it would make me more mathematically inclined if I studied piano. She was wrong. Um, And I just did all those things because my parents thought we should be busy children and have lots of interests. And I still think that's true today. Even if you're not gonna be a performer, doing something and having commitments is really good for children. And performing definitely was a way to meet friends and to have fun. I just loved it, but it built confidence as well. So I don't think that I definitely aspired to be a performer, but I loved performance. And then it strengthened other areas of my early life, like academia or like whatever. It was just a good, wholesome use of my time. And you started going to kind of auditions and putting yourself Mm -hmm. out there for opportunities as a kind of like in your late teens and things. Was there an opportunity or an audition that you went to that maybe didn't go quite as you'd imagined? Probably the worst one was when I auditioned to be in a Sean Paul music video. You know, Sean Paul, it does love a bit of Sean Paul. Reggae, yeah. All about temperature. Yes. (laughs) Ooh. See, I'm not really even sure what video it was because they didn't tell us. I was already podium dancing, as you do in university. I would love to say to pay the bills, they didn't pay us. Uh, I just like to do it for the for the love of the art. And it was very difficult to get pornography back then. So I knew that all the young uh, people in my town would wank to this show on a Friday night. It was always on and it was scantily clad young women just like gyrating to the popular music that was going on. And I knew a lot of my peers were wanking to that. And it was exactly the kind of project that I wanted to get involved in. I was like, I will dance on that podium. And I thought I was famous. And I thought, oh, uh, this is the best. And I'm such a good dancer. I was not, I was just wearing hot pants and I was 19. That was basically the, uh, the brief. But then in that rehearsal space, there was a notice for casting to be in a Sean Paul music video. And in a disgusting display of white privilege, I felt like I could be in a Sean Paul music video. I I always went around life being like, me, I'll try that, why not me? Which is good (laughs) until you find yourself with your flatmate in a hotel conference room dancing for eight bewildered men around a table. And the music was very quiet. And I had to actually dance like in a setting like this, just they went, all right, get up and dance, which is a very difficult thing to do. Get up now and dance. But I was 20 years old, 21 years old. And I went, okay. And I stood and I danced badly when all the other dancers in line were like dance hall, you know, like Jamaican print, amazing, totally qualified for this music video. I looked like I was an extra from toddlers and tiaras just lost. I wrote my roommate into it. It was a bad scene and it went, it was very awkward and they made me dance for the whole song. Songs are long. Um, And I was not cast, but I still don't regret going for it. It made me more brave for other obstacles and challenges that I would face in my life. And I get to tell my daughter now when Sean Paul comes on the radio in the car, I go, well, I was nearly in a Sean Paul music video. She goes, you were? And I was like, yeah. And I was nearly, I was more nearly in a Sean Paul music video than someone who didn't audition. Very true. Yeah. So I don't mind that failure. It was fine. Do you have a go-to dance move? Was there one particular move that you were like using for that song? Yes. Back then we had a very early version of dropping it like it was hot. Yeah. That we didn't say drop it like it's hot. We just... There was actually one of the kitchen guys at Hooters, um, one of the cooks. I worked at Hooters also. I mean, I had a really warped idea of what a woman should be. Basically, all those tabloid magazines, that was like my Bible for like, oh, I see. Um, But he was from Guyana, Guyana, and he 
taught us how to like do this little wiggly, sexy move. And that was my main move. But I also was influenced by pop music and Backstreet Boys videos. So I dragged a chair over at one point, <laughs> did some like chairography. It was not what the producers wanted to see, but I still gave it everything I had. I bet they had a good time too. Even if they were a bit baffled. I'm right. Sh I'm sure they loved it. Yeah, I was a comedian before I knew I was a comedian. <laughs> yeah. Like if that had been a character, they probably, I went away and they went, that was a hidden camera. She's got her own crew. Like this was a joke. You know, I gave them probably a good laugh. Though to their credit, they did not laugh in my face. They remained very stoic until at least I was down the hall. I don't know. So you've got now to your kind of zero fucks given mantra and you've got to that place. Um, how did you get there? How did you get to this point from being that kind of like, just want to fit in in school? I think you have to give all the fucks before you realize that you should actually give none. I think I really cared. I tried so many different ways to be well liked or to be this idea of who I thought a woman should be. And I was criticized or admonished or just got a lot of bewildered looks. I was very eccentric and an outsider. And those are not good qualities in a small town from my perspective. Where I was was an uncomfortable place. And I never wanted to upset people, but I could not make them like me. And I just reached a place where through bad relationships, toxic relationships, self-revelations, unfortunately it took until my 30s, um, a therapist and just life experience taught me it's not your job to make everyone else understand you. And it's not your job to make everyone like you because it's just an impossible strategy. And I think in relationships specifically, I'd be mistreated and I'd say, well, I'll just explain to him. Well, I just need him to understand. I just need him to see my perspective and he'll know that he was wrong. And then I just realized, no, you don't. What I need to do is just never text him back and let him say lots of things about me that are false and listen to those things and not argue and go, yeah. And that was a great lesson for me. So it, I think, started with life and then it was punctuated by relationships. And now I feel like in my work, when people don't like what I do or criticize what I've said, how I've articulated myself, I don't even get angry or hurt because I feel like they, they are totally entitled not to like me. And that is a very calming feeling. And you can apply it to school or your job or your relationships. Like you're totally entitled not to like me. I'm not gonna take that personally because I don't like everyone. You write in the book and you've said multiple times, like your onstage persona is not the person that you are every day sat in your home or whatever it is. So what would you say the biggest differences are between your onstage persona and Catherine around your friends or family? Um. I'm not glam, glam, glam in real life. I have one of I have one of two speeds. One is like drag and the other is I kind of dress like an elderly rapper in my real life, like Flavor Flav without the clock. Like I wear velour track suits and high end, you know, luxury loungewear, leisure wear, but I don't have makeup on or hair extensions and I am very quiet. Anyone who comes into our house is like, why is your house so quiet? Because we have dogs, we have a baby, and I have my daughter and my husband and me, but first of all, it's not my business. Whatever people want to take from my stage persona, that's up to them, and I just leave it to them. But I get feedback when I got married, for example, that would be like, oh my gosh, poor him. She's hard work. She's really high maintenance, like crazy bitch. And I was like, all right. And people think that I stomp around in gowns just eviscerating anyone who gets in my way and I'm full of punchlines, but I'm not that way. I'm a complete introvert. I'm an extroverted introvert. It's called the audacity. So what do you think is the most audacious thing that you've ever done? I mean, audacity is a sense of self-confidence or self-assuredness that other mm. people might find rude. And it's curious to me that, you know, the most offensive thing that I do as a woman in comedy is just exist without asking for permission. That's all that I do. I don't want anything from anyone. I don't, uh, you know, go disrupt their lives or do anything. All I'm doing is um, authentically, proudly existing, dressing how I want, saying what I want, doing what I want. And there are people who find that to be deeply 
um, offensive, which is why we all have to do it more. Mm -hmm. And finally, do you have uh, a top tip for being courageous? Mm. If I could just pick one, I think um, that courage comes from fearlessness and courage for me isn't something, it's just a lack of something else. So I do mm. have an absence of fear. I'm not afraid of failure and I don't really have an ego, even though it really seems like I do. I don't mind if something doesn't go my way and I don't feel hurt if someone dislikes what I've created, especially when they are someone who creates nothing. Always remember that, who cares? And um, it's just an absence of self-consciousness and of fear. And if you don't have those things and you know you're being kind and you're not hurting anyone, then you can just go forth and try everything in life that's fun. And then you regret nothing because you've been courageous. Well, regretting nothing is obviously all of our goals. So thank you very much. Um, the Audacity is a wonderful book. It's a really lovely read. And thank you so much for coming to chat to me. Thank you. I'm so sorry. You probably have to read like a hundred books a week. It's a good one. Do you like it? Yeah. Did you like it? Good. Okay. I really appreciate you reading it. Sorry for all the naughty words.